Good morning. I'm Deidre Gifford, the Executive Director of the Connecticut Office of Health Strategy. Welcome, everyone, Governor Lamont, our legislative colleagues, um, our friends from the healthcare community, and advocates. We are very, very happy to be here today to uh, watch Governor Lamont sign House Bill 6669, a bill that will move Connecticut forward towards a more affordable health care system. We are all here today for one reason, and that is that health care in Connecticut and around the country has become unaffordable for too many people. As a physician, I find this unacceptable. I know what it's like to sit with a patient and help her try to figure out what lab tests or medications she can forego and which she can afford, even though they've all been recommended for her. This is an agonizing process for patients, for their providers, and it's unfortunately something we are seeing more and more in our state and around the country. At the same time, we know that our healthcare system is filled with hardworking people and institutions. They provide essential care and they bring innovations to all of us. Our efforts to lower health care costs must be done in partnership with these entities and with respect for the value that they bring to our communities. And that's reflected in all of the parties that you see here this morning. But everyone must do their part. We must find ways to bring down the cost of health care so that everyone, no matter their income or their health status, can have access to the care that they need without the fear of incurring debt or worse, bankruptcy, or needing to come back on food, rent, or other basic needs. In 2022, a survey in Connecticut showed that over half of respondents to the survey experienced at least one health care affordability challenge in 2022. Nearly four in five who responded to the survey worry about affording health care in the future. Lower income respondents and respondents with disabilities are more likely to go without care and incur debt due to health care costs. And no matter their party affiliation, the respondents to the survey were very positive about government taking um, a leading role in helping find solutions. Governor Lamont has directed his team to tackle this very challenging issue. HB 6669 is the result of months of collaboration with our legislative partners, industry stakeholders, and it begins the process of us getting a handle on health care costs in Connecticut and tackling affordability for our residents. You'll hear from others this morning about the major provisions in the bill, but it is wide ranging and it includes provisions that will do several things. First of all, tackle the issue of health care consolidation and enhance competition. It does this by banning so-called anti-competitive contracting practices that make it harder for insurers and consumers to learn about and access the highest quality, lowest cost providers. And it also injects some transparency into the, for providers into the insurer contracting processes. This is a very, very significant step that will make it easier for insurers and providers to control costs and maximize quality. The bill lowers costs by extending the existing law that prohibits so-called facility fees charged by hospitals for certain services. Facility fees are charged in addition to professional fees and have been a growing part of the cost equation. We have more work to do in this area to avoid unnecessary costs in the healthcare system. The bill tackles drug costs by having Connecticut join a consortium to buy discounted drugs with several other states and allow any resident to use the discount card. 
It makes sure that consumers and prescribers know when drug prices are going up by authorizing my office to publish a list of uh, large drug price increases year over year and make it e making it easier for my office to get the information we need from our industry partners. It requires drug marketers to sign up and register with the state and make sure they are providing clear, accurate, and transparent information about the drugs that they are marketing. It also increases transparency by studying the practices of pharmacy benefit managers, which are middlemen between uh, drug producers and insurers. And it studies the Medicare Advantage program to see how their business models are impacting cost, quality, and the experiences of patients and providers in the system. So for all those reasons, HB 669, 6669, is a great start, but we have more work to do. And that work is already beginning uh, by many of the people you see up here. Connecticut's health care costs are among the highest in the country, and those costs are rising faster than personal income. In March, my office released the state's first ever health care cost growth benchmark report, which underscored the need for legislative reforms to address affordability. Benchmark, the benchmark initiative was created by Governor Lamont in 2020 and passed into law last year to hold the health care system accountable for providing affordable care to our residents. The benchmark target was set working with health care representatives and consumer advocates and represents how much health care spending can reasonably increase year over year to remain affordable for the residents of Connecticut. Our March report showed that health care spending in the state increased between 2020 and 2021 by 6% overall, surpassing our benchmark of 3.4%. Commercial health insurance spending was the biggest contributor, increasing at nearly 19% year over year. While the 2021 cost growth was impacted by the pandemic, the increase in Connecticut's commercial spending exceeded that of other states that have benchmarks, including Massachusetts and Rhode Island, that saw commercial increases of 16% and 10% respectively. So Connecticut was the highest commercial growth rate of any state that currently has a cost growth benchmark. Our analysis of Connecticut data shows that prescription drug prices and hospital costs are key drivers of healthcare cost and growth. We know that increases have outpaced the cost of basic needs like, like groceries, milk, and gasoline. Tomorrow, I'm delighted to, uh, to announce that OHS will hold its first ever cost growth benchmark hearing as required by our statute. OHS has identified entities that are a significant part of the healthcare cost equation and has invited them to engage in a conversation with OHS and with national experts at the hearing on how we can control costs in the future. We will hear from hospitals, insurers, and at least one drug manufacturer, Bristol Myers Squibb. We're looking forward to a productive set of conversations that we hope and are confident will result in further ideas and direction and collaboration that we can collectively take to lower health care costs. Unfortunately, AbbVie, the maker of the very expensive drug called Humira, uh, which retails for close to $7,000 per month, has declined to participate in tomorrow's hearing, despite being required by Connecticut statute to do so. We look forward to hearing from AbbVie as to how they intend to control drug costs in the future in our state, and we thank Bristol-Myers Squibb for collaborating with us on the hearing tomorrow. Healthcare cost reform is a complex, very complex issue, and legislative action like this bill are critical in charting a course towards a more affordable health care for Connecticut. In healthcare, one person's high cost is another's revenue. So the conversations are difficult and there are entrenched interests on many sides. But if we keep affordability, access, and quality of care at the center of the conversation, we can and will make progress toward a more affordable system. 
And with that, I would like to introduce our uh, terrific Commissioner of the Department of Public Health, Manisha Jitani. Good morning. Health is a human right, not a privilege. Everybody's heard that saying. But in Connecticut, we all work together to make that a reality and not just something that people say. Too many people are faced with deciding whether they should put food on their table for their children or older people in their homes versus filling prescription medications. That's just one example. In the Department of Public Health, we're always about prevention. When people forego preventative measures because they're worried about the bottom line, that ultimately is only going to be a cost driver in the end. So making health care affordable and this type of partnership that Connecticut has to offer the residents of our state is only going to move us in the right direction. As the COVID-19 pandemic emergency has ended, there's so many aspects of COVID care, whether it be vaccines or treatments, that were free to people through the state, through the federal government. These are all being included in routine health care now. For our most vulnerable populations, our underinsured, uninsured, the health care system is going to be absorbing all of this. The more we can have an eye on the ball of keeping cost affordable for everybody, the better chance we are at having a healthy Connecticut. And I'm very proud of the partnership that our state has to be able to try to accomplish that for people. I will now introduce our Commissioner of the Department of Social Services, Commissioner Barton Reeves. Good morning. Uh, I want to thank the governor for his leadership in advocating for the state's residents through this legislation. You heard my colleagues speak about the, really the four critical issues that this legislation addresses. Making drugs affordable, fostering competition and limiting fees, increasing transparency, and increasing access to health care, and advocating and advancing health equity. As you know, the Department of Social Services serves 1.2 million people in the state through the services that we provide. What many people don't know is that if you make one dollar above the level of eligibility, that doesn't make you any more accessible and it doesn't create any more accessibility for you as a person or as a family. And that's why this legislation is so critical. Because although we talk about families that may be SNAP eligible, they may be Medicaid eligible, they may be eligible for long-term supports and services, and everything else that we do at DSS, we really don't talk about all of the families that need support. And that is why this legislation is so revolutionary. Because it addresses the fact that it's not just the people who we think are receiving services through the Department of Social Services and other services in DPH, but it's every family that's trying to figure out how to pay for drugs or pay for groceries. It's every family that's trying to figure out how to keep their houses warm or cool, how to be able to afford things for their children. It means basic dignity for every family in this state. So I'm proud to stand here with my colleagues, and particularly with the governor, to say to him thank you for having the foresight to be able to make this happen and to all of our colleagues who understand that healthcare affordability, it's not just a nicety, it's actually a right in our state and I'm glad to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners. Um, uh, as you've heard, part of getting this bill over the finish line um, had to do with a lot of partnership and collaboration. Um, so I'd like to introduce two individuals representing the Connecticut hospitals who uh, worked with us on the language of the bill and invested a lot of time in um, coming up with uh, solutions. And they are Patrick Charmel, President and CEO of Griffin Hospital in Derby, and John Murphy, President and CEO of New Vance Health. Thank you, Dr. Gifford. Uh, my name is John Murphy, the CEO of New Vance Health. And it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank Governor Lamont for inviting us to be here today and also for inviting us to actively participate in the construction of this bill and the policies that belie it. 
I, I will assure you that everybody up here, including uh, all of the hospitals in the state of Connecticut and the leadership of those hospitals, shares a commitment to what you've heard uh, Dr. Gifford say, and that is we are, we are very committed to providing high quality health care, but making sure that that care is affordable, accessible, equitable, and patient-centered. And this bill reflects the input of many stakeholders, including those that provide health care, but we were all committed to continuously improving the quality of care while simultaneously making sure that the cost of that care comes down and that the access to that care grows day by day. What you may not know is that during the pandemic, we worked very closely and regularly. As a matter of fact, the last time I was in this room was just after the pandemic broke. We had admitted, I think, our, our first few patients, and we had a press conference in this very room with uh, Governor Lamont at the head of the table, really asking us, were we prepared? And ever since that day, really, for the next year or two, Every week we met a series of healthcare uh, leaders, the governor and his team and, and Dr. Gifford and, the, and Dr. Juthani worked uh, almost every week. I think in a, in a gesture of generosity, the governor did give us off Christmas Eve, I think in 2020. But other than that, it was uh, really a remarkable body of work where we uh, came to understand each other's needs and the administration did everything that they could to be sure that the hospitals in this state had what they needed when they needed it to provide the exceptional care that we did provide during that time of crisis. We also came during that period of time to understand the critical interdependencies that existed and the depth of those interdependencies. But a byproduct of the work was the level of trust that grew and I will tell you, having worked with several prior administrations, we have never had the depth of trust that we currently have with an administration and a sense of understanding of each other that is reflected in this bill. Over the past two months, as Dr. Gifford said, we worked regularly to be sure that our voices were heard and understood and were actively uh, uh, incorporated into the thinking that went into this bill. Uh, HB 6669 does address, I believe, uh, a number of issues regarding access and affordability, particularly, for instance, uh, in eliminating some of the administrative barriers that simply add cost to care. There is a study that's incorporated in the bill which will uh, allow the state to look more deeply at Medicare Advantage and, and some of the inefficiencies that exist therein in an effort, again, to uh, improve affordability and improve accessibility. And then lastly, we are very committed, as you know, to providing equitable care in our communities. And we believe that there are a number of features of this bill that will allow us to do this and to enhance and support the great work that hospitals are doing to be sure that the care that we provide to our communities is equitable, affordable, and accessible. Thank you. Hi, I'm Pat Charmel, and I'm President and CEO of Griffin Health. When the governor proposed his bold, multi-pronged legislation designed to reduce health care costs and increase affordability, he called on all of the parties that probably contributed to the current problems that we have in the health care system and asked them to come to the table to be part of the solution. And as my colleague, Dr. Murphy, indicated, because of the trust that we've developed over time, we were willing to come to the table and talk frankly about the challenges that we face in the industry and what we saw as some of the difficulties with the legislation being proposed. Not because it wasn't well intended, but because of the complexity of the healthcare delivery system and the current fragile nature of the provider community. And I have to say that to a person, everybody in the administration, and this is, a, I think, a function of the governor's leadership, they were very receptive to listening. Um, this was, these were full contact conversations. Uh, they were cordial, but each party got to say its piece. And there was a real commitment to try and understand each party's perspective. Um, I got the sense that there was a commitment to getting it right 
just not getting it done. And that's really important given, you know, with healthcare delivery, if you break it, you own it. And so we didn't want to do anything that would actually make the problem worse. The goal was increasing affordability, which affects access, which affects equity and quality. And as an industry, we are committed to meeting those goals. We were able to work through a series of issues and there are a number of immediate uh, interventions that will help us achieve the goals that were set out. But there was also a recognition and built into the bill is an effort for the parties to continue to work to look at our Medicaid program, which is one of the most innovative Medicaid programs in the state, to take it and make it even more innovative in addressing the upstream drivers of health. One in five adults and one in four children in Connecticut are covered by the Husky program. It not only has an impact on those individuals that benefit directly, but it impacts the broader healthcare delivery system and we want to understand that interconnectedness, the capabilities that we develop as an industry to address the most vulnerable population can actually benefit all of Connecticut citizens. So we look forward to not only continuing the dialogue, but to working together to achieve these important object objectives. So I want to thank everybody that participated, but especially the governor, because he actually set the tone at the top. And this started with the governor as a candidate. He understood that this is a very complex system. He understood how important hospitals and healthcare providers are to the health and well-being of Connecticut citizens, uh, health and well-being of Connecticut citizens, but also to the economic viability of the state. So I appreciate uh, his partnership and we look forward to continuing to work together to improve health care and the health of Connecticut citizens. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Murphy and Pat. And just to clarify, Pat was speaking metaphorically when he talked about the full contact <laughs> meetings. Um, so as you've heard uh, from uh, the speakers this morning, uh, Governor Lamont, uh, really believes in partnership in solving complex problems. And one of our critical partners um, in this process um, has been the Office of the State Comptroller. And uh, it's really critical that we have alignment across the Office of Health Strategy, the Medicaid program, the State Employee Health Program, and in all these initiatives. Um, Comptroller Scanlon has taken a leading role on looking at drug prices, and um, we're delighted to be working with him as part of this initiative. Mr. Comptroller. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, you know, I was probably 10 or 11 years old when I first realized there was something wrong with our health care system. And I was raised by a small business owner who was a single mom. And we would go to the Guilford CVS, and my mom, who never had health insurance, uh, would be begging that pharmacist to see if there was an alternative because she just couldn't afford the drug that he was prescribing to her that that doctor that she paid cash to go to uh, was, was prescribing for her. And so there's some great irony now that as the state comptroller, uh, I have a, uh, a front seat role at working with that very company uh, to oversee the drug contract for the state of Connecticut, which is one of the largest contracts that that company holds in the United States of America. And through that partnership, we are doing some really innovative things to lower the cost of drugs for the state employees and their family members and the retirees here in Connecticut. But thanks to the leadership of the governor and under this piece of legislation, we're going to go a step further. We're going to take the benefits that we have and the leverage that we have by working with a company like CVS and make sure that everybody in the state of Connecticut can get a card that's a drug discount card that they can use at their local pharmacy counter starting this fall to lower the cost of their drugs dramatically. And that will be a significant savings to the men and women of Connecticut who right now are seeing their drug costs go up and up and up. 
This card that we will roll out the details of in the coming weeks, uh, like I said, will be available this fall. And it's projected to save the average Connecticut resident 80% on the cost of their generic drugs and 20% on the cost of their brand name drugs. That is real serious relief for people who are fed up by the cost of their drugs. And that is just one of the many pieces of this piece of legislation that's going to have an immediate impact on many, many people like my mom that are living in the state of Connecticut that need help with the affordability of health care. And just to close, I'll just say this. If you're hearing a common denominator in all the remarks so far, it's the governor. And it's that the governor was willing to sit down and try to understand this issue. And I mean this with all due respect in a, in a positive way. He's curious about health care. And when I say curious, it's every time I talk to him, literally every time I talk to him, he asks me something else about ways that he's thinking about lowering the cost of health care for Connecticut residents and trying to sit down and build meaningful coalitions and partnerships, whether it's with bipartisan groups of legislators, whether it's with organizations like the hospital systems here in Connecticut, or whether it's another office like mine, to find ways that we can tackle this problem. Uh, I'm a recovering legislator, uh, and, and I used to chair the insurance committee here in this building. Uh, and I learned a very long time ago that there's no one silver bullet solution to solving health care affordability and access in this state. It's a cumulative effort where we try to make progress each and every year, each and every day. That's what we're doing thanks to Governor Lamont's leadership. That's what we're doing in partnership with the legislature and the private sector and the providers. And that's what I hope that each and every one of us will commit to to going back to that central premise, which is that health care, as Dr. Gifford said, is far too unaffordable for far too many people in Connecticut. And I hope that them listening tonight will know that we're doing everything we can in our power to lower your costs because we hear you and we're working on it every single day. Thank you all very much. So uh, it goes without saying that uh, this bill obviously would not have uh, made it past the finish line without a really significant bipartisan partnership with our legislative colleagues. Um, it was a delight for me to get to know our new public health chairs uh, this year and our ranking members, and um, we look forward to working with them in the future. The legislative leadership was um, supportive and instrumental and I'd like to thank them and introduce Senate President Martin Looney. Thank you very much, Commissioner. This is a, a great day to celebrate the, the significant advance we have made in accountability and transparency uh, in healthcare and an effort toward cost controls in, in this bill. Uh, and I want to thank the governor for his, his leadership in this, taking an interest in it, uh, addressing concerns, uh, all the way through the process to, to build support, to sustain support. Uh, I know the speaker shares my view. I spoke with him just before uh, this event. He is uh, uh, unfortunately unable to be here, had another, another commitment. But this is a very, very important uh, incremental step, as the, the prior speakers have said. Uh, obviously, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, there is no silver bullet, as the controller said, except perhaps the, uh, the one that he supported as uh, chair of uh, the insurance uh, uh, committee, which is uh, universal health care. Uh, public option, which we hope will, uh, I hope will occur at the national level, uh, so that they will, the ideal situation is not to have a connection between employment status um, and having health insurance. Uh, we're still some uh, distance away from, uh, from that. Uh, but it, measures like this move us closer uh, to affordability, accountability, uh, helping to reduce the fears that uh, uh, the people like Controller Scanlon's mother have uh, in dealing with prescription costs that run affordable because there is no insurance or co-pays that are so high as to be <clears throat> unaffordable. We have to be uh, especially vigilant, I think, about uh, pharmacy benefit managers, and that's why I'm, I'm very pleased there is a provision in this bill that addresses a, a greater uh, uh, accountability and uh, transparency on their behalf. As some of you may recall, uh, four years ago, uh, we found out that there was a, a practice going on among pharmacy benefit managers of imposing gag orders on pharmacists. So the pharmacists could not tell their customers that in some cases it would be cheaper uh, to pay cash for a generic drug than it would be to put it through their insurance because the copay in some cases was higher than the cash price would have been. Uh, we banned that in Connecticut. I believe we were the first state to do so. Uh, NBC News covered the story. Uh, they had to go all the way to California 
uh, to find a pharmacist who was willing to go on record and talk about uh, that gag order that was imposed upon them. So eternal vigilant, uh, vigilance is important to, in that area. But that's why I'm so, uh, so pleased that we have uh, uh, this measure. Uh, we will build upon it next year uh, and in years to come. Uh, good to see my great friend uh, Pat Charmel here. I got tremendous care at Griffin Hospital several years ago when I had a hip replacement there. I'd recommend it to anybody. And, uh, uh, but again, uh, again this, is, this is a day to celebrate significant progress uh, and to thank the governor for his leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. And now I'd like to introduce legislative colleagues who will introduce one another. Senator uh, Saad Anwar, our public health co-chair. Representative Kristen McCarthy Vahey, public health co-chair. Representative Nicole Claridis Dietria, public health ranking member. And Senator Tony Wong, insurance committee ranking member. Um, hello, everyone. Actually, what we can do is we can have all the legislators who are over here from Insurance Committee as well as from actually um, you're part of our effort as well. Come join us. Yeah, <laughs> Representative Nuccio. <laughs> Representative Nuccio. So uh, if you look over here, uh, this is one of the bills with the leadership of the governor. It took literally a village to bring this uh, bill across the finish line. Uh, because when the, the, the bill was proposed, we looked at it and we looked at the breadth and the depth and the, the number of stakeholders that were necessary because of the subject matter, we knew this was going to consume a lot of our effort and time. So, Governor, congratulations on your leadership. Congratulations on your team's leadership. Because uh, um, with your vision, the ones who were trying to implement this effort, uh, they were negotiating pretty much about 16 hours a day on the various components. And because uh, we literally had conversations on various aspects of the bill on a regular basis. And, and uh, when we had the conversation, we knew that there were three-dimensional chess game that was going on because there were multilateral discussions that were going on. And at the end of the day, it was just like, it was all about 6669. We said, well, there are probably more bills too. But this became a center of our existence for many, many days in the entire session. Uh, in the last many days, it was one of the last bill that passed uh, in, in the Senate. And it took um, a lot of good work on the part of Governor, your leadership, your team. But the amazing thing about this bill is that I think it's, it's an important part of the news uh, and, and information that needs to go out is that this bill had support from the Republicans, from the Democrats, from the House, from the Senate, from the various other stakeholders. By the time the product was ready, we actually had uh, unanimous support on this bill. Absolute unanimous support on this bill from all different angles if you, if you look at it. And, and yes, there may be somebody who's unhappy at some levels, but it took a lot of effort for us to be able to get to this point. And uh, this was the village. And um, we probably started to speak about this bill in, the, in our dreams at one point because there were so many things happening in this. But this is going to help our community. This is going to help the citizens. This is going to help the federally qualified healthcare centers because the 340B program has had a, a, an existential threat to th uh, the, the federally qualified healthcare centers. We are going to be able to address part of that. And then it also has created a framework to tackle one of the most difficult areas, the cost of healthcare, and see how it would get translated into the, the real benefits to our citizens. There are members of the insurance committee. I'm a co-chair of the insurance committee as well, and I'm, I'm currently the co-chair of public health. And, and there are parts of this bill which are related to insurance. So it was uh, also not one committee. It was more than one committee that was working on this. So I will stop here. I know my co-chair has some things to add, and she has a very nice name for this bill in the beginning, if you want to say that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. I will echo my thanks to the governor. The nickname that I had for this bill when it was first introduced was the Beast. And I want to thank the governor for, and his team for walking into the belly of the Beast and staying at the table, keeping people at the table. The governor talks about the Connecticut way. This is the Connecticut way. The Connecticut way is that we compromise, we work together. We work across systems. We work with people who are stakeholders from every aspect of this issue, across offices, across parties. And we get things done for the people of Connecticut. This will make an impact for people's lives. 
and I'm proud to be a part of this and working in partnership with my colleagues. Uh, I will add, yes, this did end up passing on consent in the Senate. So we are very grateful that we were able to get to this place. And as Dr. Gifford said, this is a wonderful foundation for the work that we will continue because we know that being healthy, safe, and strong is what life is all about. And that's what this bill seeks to do, is to help our residents to be healthy, safe, and strong. And we need to continue that work, and I'm committed to doing so. So thank you so much, Governor Lamont, Dr. Gifford, the Hospital Association partners, everyone who was part of this effort. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. As Representative McCarthy Bay, he said, this truly was a beast, and that's what we referred to it on many occasions, hours and days working on this bill. I want to thank the governor for bringing this to our attention. We worked hours and hours on this bill with every stakeholder, our, my fellow legislators. We worked hard. We went back and forth many times, and I want to thank my town, Griffin Hospital, Pat Charmel, for the hard work he did and the knowledge he gave to me. I know more about the 340B program than I will ever intend to know in my life. But again, what you've heard, the underlying theme about this bill, HB 6669, is it will decrease health care costs and increase accessibility. And as legislators, that's our job. Also need to shout out to CHA for the hard work they did with working to get this bill across the finish line. And we're all committed together to work, to continue that work next year and continue to make health care affordable and more accessible. Thank you. Senator Tony Huang, we all work very hard on this bill because accessible and effective health care is essential. But it also is a very deeply personal decision. And one of the big criteria that we address in this issue and in all the bills that we consider related to health care costs is affordability. And affordability in, in the areas of our hospital providers, medical devices, and, and providers, and, and pharmaceutical. These are all considerations. We had a really good start in regards to the governor's leadership on benchmarking. This bill is a start in addressing issues related to pharmaceutical costs through the PBM study and also the discount card. Pharmaceutical costs is one of the biggest components. Evaluating 340B, that is one component that, that we are targeting. A second area is hospital contracting in regards to how we manage those costs. It ultimately becomes how do we provide effective, accessible health care that is cost effective but without sacrificing quality. And I want to extend, as repeatedly by many of my colleagues, Governor Lamont has, has made the effort by breaking silos, by incorporating many of the various shareholders and brought them into the room to have a earnest discussion. Compromises occurred because not everybody was happy and you got to a finish line that is a finished product, but ultimately, it broke down silos, and I am here as one of the leaders of the insurance committee who co-introduced the amended bill because we all need to work across the line, various committees and making commitments to finding the best product. So when I talk about the governor's leadership in breaking through silos and the various shareholders, I applaud this bill as part of a effort by the legislative body in crossing silos and working together. So thank you very much for being here. You all have been very patient. You're waiting for the star of the event who should be coming up. I'm not the star of the event, but <laughs> I'm Representative Tammy Nuccio, and I just want to, again, as everybody has said, thank everyone for being here. One of the things that's most important to me has been since I was elected is accessibility and affordability of health care. I've had that conversation with many people in the legislature and also with the governor's office. And um, as other people have said, the governor is always willing to listen to this and, and work to look at how we can do it. This bill is a really good bill. It does cross over between public health, insurance, and multiple other areas because health care crosses over multiple different areas. And looking at how people interact with the health care system is a broad, broad brush approach. It's not something as simple as one bill. And this bill is a really good start. Um, 
I want to see us go further. I want to see us be more aggressive and be stronger on this. And I actually said that to the governor already. So while we're passing this, we're celebrating this. The governor is going to sign it today. I'm hoping tomorrow we start the work again and we start looking at how we can back into the belly of the beast, as I guess I should say, <laughs> um, figure out what we can do to, to make this um, long, sustainable, and even more affordable because uh, that's the most important thing for our residents right now is accessibility and affordability. I'm happy to have been part of the team that's looked at this and voted for it and brought it forward and I just hope that we continue um, to make better strides, stronger strides for the people and I have confidence in the team of people here and in the governor's office to do exactly that. So thank you. I just wanted to recognize the ranking member in the Senate, uh, Senator Summers, and her work. She could not be here because of a scheduling conflict, but uh, Senator Summers has put in a lot of work to make sure that we get all the stakeholders together, so thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce the person you've heard a lot about. I will offer my personal thanks to the governor for his encouragement. Uh, when the beast was threatening to swallow us all, the governor um, was, um, uh, as usual, very supportive and um, uh, supportive of his team. So, uh, Governor Lamont. Right. Thank you, Dre. Um, this is the team that got it done. Um, just a couple of things. Uh, Connecticut has the best health care in the world. But it only works if you can afford it, and, uh, and that's why we're here. Um, I was struck by um, Sean's story about his mom at, at CVS. And um, you know, you go into CVS, and uh, you go down a shelf, and you know the Tylenol is going to cost you seven bucks. It's, you, you, it's easy. And then you go up to the uh, pharmacist, and um, I have no idea what that's going to cost. It's 17, 170, dear, you said $7,000 a month, depending on what it might be. And we're trying to do something to give you a little more optionality, make sure it's more transparent, make sure you get the very best value for your dollar. And that's what the drug discount card is all about. That's really meaningful to me. Um, Sean, Deirdre, Deirdre working with a variety of other states, so we get some purchasing power there. So when you go up to that pharmacist, you're going to get the very best value. Maybe it's a generic drug, a generic drug that can save you up to 80%. That's how you get a little more choice, and that's how you can bring down costs and get the very best value. I, I also like that, you know, all that anti-steering stuff is just a way of, I think, ripping off the consumer. And uh, what we did in this bill was say, look, you have the right to know. You have the right to know where you can get the very best value when it comes to, say, um, your knee or your hip. And uh, I think you heard it right here. Pat Charmel, go there for your hip. John Murphy, go there for your knee. Um, there are sometimes real differences. And uh, I think uh, you have a right to know. And that's what this bill is going to show you, where you can get significant savings, better value. Value means quality, not just cost. And that's what we're trying to uh, make available to each and every one of you. And as, um, as Sammy said, we're just getting started. And I'd like to say, um, open door, bigger table. That's, it is about compromise in, in getting things done. Um, that's what you got to do in this building to get things done. And um, Marty, you and the, the legislative team know how to get that, make that possible. It's also getting the stakeholders at the table. And that includes, um, you know, the hospitals. That includes the advocates. That includes the more different points of view you get around the table, the better deal you're going to figure out that takes into account all the different um, quarters and twists and turns. I think that's what we got going with this bill. That's why I'm so proud to be here with all the people that made it happen. Let's sign the bill.
we're happy to take any on-topic questions. Oh, sorry. So, pardon my skepticism for, for a bill that passed the House 147 to 3 and the Senate 35 to 1. Uh, Sean got into what uh, people are actually going to save money on. Can you give us a ballpark figure on uh, the average people in Connecticut, how much they're going to be saving as a result of this bill? Um, it's a good question, and it's the right question. Um, you heard all of us talking about the complexity of the healthcare system, and it's sometimes difficult to attach a direct savings from an action. What we are looking at at the Office of Health Strategy is an overall decline in the rate of growth of healthcare costs, and that's what we want to see. We want to see the benchmark of uh, this year, 3.2%, being met, and a, a decline across the board in uh, in costs. So, you know, we're taking a first steps on drug prices. We're taking first steps on uh, additional steps on facility fees. We'll watch with interest what happens with the anti-competitive contracting terms and how that plays out. Um, but those are such complex issues that it, you can't always draw a straight line to a dollar amount. What are your immediate goals for the next session? No, no rest for the weary. I, I think uh, we're going to continue to talk about affordability, accessibility, equity, and quality. And we're going to keep those, as I said in my remarks, we're going to keep those things at the center of the conversation. You've heard a very diverse group of stakeholders talk about uh, a consensus around those issues. So we don't disagree that we have to keep making progress towards affordability in Connecticut. We'll keep having those full contact conversations and we'll keep putting difficult issues on the table and, uh, and we'll move forward in a, in a variety of different ways when you, when on costs. When you're doing your benchmark, how will you be, I mean, how long is it gonna be able to take you before you have enough you know, data? The, the controller said this, Card is going to be rolled out in the, the next several months. So that's, you know, you're only going to have a partial calendar year of 2023. Uh, you know, what, when do you expect to be able to point at least to some general aggregate numbers? 2025, 2026? Well, as you know, we started uh, already looking at cost growth between 2020 and 2021. Um, in March of next year, we, we will look at the subsequent two years. Um, and underneath each one of those benchmarks is a whole lot of data about what's driving the increases. So we've talked about hospital costs, we've talked about uh, pharmaceutical costs, and uh, we're working even outside of this legislation to uh, find all the ways we can to keep cost growth at the benchmark. One of the reasons why states enact uh, the benchmark program, uh, like Governor Lamont signed uh, by executive order in 2020, one of the reasons they do that is because it sets a goal for conversations between providers and insurers about how fast we want to see costs going up. And so those things are, those things are happening outside of these uh, legislative conversations. Uh, Governor, can you tell us uh, what you wanted but did not get in this bill? I couldn't figure out um, the objections to the um, out-of-network caps. Uh, John and Pat will explain that to me again. Um, I just thought that um, sometimes those procedures, you end up with an incredibly expensive surprise bill. And I thought that would have enhanced uh, some of the negotiations between the hospitals and insurers, but um, maybe I have something still to learn there. But broadly speaking, I think uh, this is a bill that makes a real difference. The underlying cost of health care are pharmaceutical hospitalizations. This deals with that in a way, helps the uh, consumers get um, the very best value for the dollar, and it rewards those hospitals that provide the very best value for the dollar. The budget included some money, not what you were looking for, but some money for medical debt. When could we start to see people benefit from that forgiveness? Uh, I think uh, by the end of this year. We've already got a... Um, a team in place that's going to be implementing this. Uh, we ended up with, you know, not as much money perhaps as I would have uh, wanted, but we're still going to be able to 
probably write down, write off about six, seven hundred million dollars in medical debt, which is a black cloud hanging over working families who uh, got slammed with this due to no fault of their own. So it's going to make a difference. And um, if it works and you, you like the results of it, Marty, maybe we'll be back next year. <laughs> uh, can you, can you give us an idea of when, you know, a better idea of a timetable? I'm sure people that are going to be viewing, listening, and, and, and reading our reports on this are going to be wondering, man, that sounds pretty good. What can I really expect to get? Early fall. Early fall? Yeah, I think in the next two or three weeks, we're going to finalize. And it, not to sound presumptuous, but we, we felt pretty good about this bill passing. And so before the bill even began passing, my office started meeting with the consortium that we would be joining if given the authority to do so under the law. Uh, and we expect that in the next two or three weeks, we'll be able to make an announcement to the public to say, hey, starting on this date, you can get this card and here's how you can actually do that. But I'm committing right now to absolutely the early part of fall. And we don't need any federal approvals or nothing like that? Nope. It's using the leverage of the fact that we buy $300 million worth of drugs for the state employee plan right now just in Connecticut to partner with other states that are doing this. And again, the, the cost estimates that I gave, 80% on generics, 20% on brand, those are not just made up numbers. Those are the actual numbers that people are seeing right now in the three states that are doing this that we're now joining as the fourth state. Besides the prescription card that you were just talking about, um, what other ways will residents some of the provisions in this bill actually show up as savings in their everyday lives. I don't know if the want to talk about that. For anyone who's like yeah. <laughs> Hi, so I can talk to the anti-steering and the anti-tearing. Um, that piece of it is directly attributable to when you're looking for a provider from your insurance um, perspective. You can no longer, you can look, they're gonna have to list the best cost for a service and it's not going to be you have to go to one of our providers that's a big piece because what we're seeing is a lot of driving people to you're going to the provider that's in my network and that price is then negotiated based off of the higher contract right so it's increasing the cost of health care when you should be able to just look up if I want a knee replacement or if I want a hip replacement or I want my mammogram or my MRI where can I go that has good quality and a lesser cost? So n enabling the fact that we're not going to be able or that we're not going to see more tearing and steering will directly impact the, the price of health care for individuals. That you should see pretty quickly. And then an, an, a consumer is more informed and can make a better decision based off of their own monetary value. One of the issues that the governor was speaking about, is that one of the things that you want to come back to work on? Or not? I, mean, I would like to. I think we need to come back on the out of network. I think we also need to come back on um, the benchmark, and we need to have a benchmark with teeth. Um, if you don't meet the levels that are out there, then I think we should have some way to enforce that for you to have to justify why the levels are higher. Um, and for the out of network, I think we definitely have to. Um, you look at what people are charged for out of network care and how it's paid for from an insurance perspective. It is an extremely inflated rate. So personally, I would definitely like to see that revisited um, with more depth. Like I said, I'm available tomorrow. We can start talking about you know, how we can move this forward in the next session. So you, you mentioned earlier with the manufacturing in era is ignoring you guys. I mean, what, I mean that, doesn't sound, that doesn't sound nice. It may not be legal. Um, I wanted, I wanted, I'll get to that question, but I want to just um, add one more area where consumers might see um, an immediate uh, difference once the legislation takes effect, and that has to do with facility fees. I mentioned that we have existing prohibitions on certain facility fee charges. Uh, we were able to extend that to additional services uh, that take place at hospitals, and uh, the bill also gives the Office of Health Strategy additional enforcement capacity when we find that facility fees may be being charged in areas where uh, they are not allowed, that we can actually uh, enforce that prohibition. With respect, right, so we, uh, the uh, Office of Health Strategy identified entities uh, that were um, contributing to our benchmark findings in 2021. Um, we invited them to participate in the hearing, and uh, all are participating uh, with the exception of one pharmaceutical manufacturer. They were required. 
Well, the uh, statute reads that they are required. But is there anything the state can do to force them or sanction them for not participating? No.